Mark 2 verse 1. Why don't we do this together? And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed therein, the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Amen. I like that. Father, bless now your word to your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. I was watching a documentary recently where they were showing people who have dropped the ball. I'm talking about sports figures who were in a good place to win national championships. People who were in a good place to get a gold, but somehow they dropped the ball. Uh, there was no reason why they should, they should have scored the goal. They say in cricket, catches make matches. But some have dropped the ball and they were showing how some have replayed that situation over and over again. In fact, some have never been able to forgive themselves because they know that their team lost such a crucial victory and could have won national championships. One man they were interviewing, I mean, the game is long over. We're talking about 50 years ago. And the man has got his name in the Hall of Fame. He's won trophies and won games all around. But he remembers this one game where they could have uh, won the championship, but he dropped the ball. And dropped ball memories don't go away, away very quickly. They don't fade very quickly. They stay with us. And by the way, it's, it's possible that there are some people here today who have dropped the ball. You may, have thinking, you may be thinking of some experience where you have made some mistake that has caused someone or yourself shame, disgrace, or embarrassment. Some of us have dropped the balls and feeling that we have wasted our lives. For others, you, your, your past still pursues you. I want to say to you that you may have failed, but you're not a failure. Can I get a witness in this place? Thank God that Christ came into the, into the world for people like you and for people like me because the fact of the matter is we've all dropped the ball. Oh, I know you're all looking like you're going to heaven, but we've all dropped the ball. Come on and get together a witness. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I say we have dropped the ball, Zachary. Yeah, we, we have dropped the ball, and some of us have let the team down because we know that we came up short. Some say, in fact, that they, that they have suffered as a result of their fumbles and, 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 and mistakes. To be sure, um, some of us have had greater consequences than others for dropping the ball in life. Some have been blessed with more talent than common sense. Some has, have caused suffering of a ruined marriage, a dysfunctional family. You've got angry kids and alienated members, dysfunctional relationships and estranged arrangements. In, and, and, and they are interruptions that you never plan for because you are guilty of dropping the ball. I've talked to people, you know, as a pastor, of people who cannot forgive themselves. I talked to one man many years ago. He said, God gave me a good wife, but I mistreated her. He gave me wonderful children, but I neglected them. And no matter how hard I tried to assure him that God has forgiven him, I learned that my words had to be rehearsed over and over again because parched soil of fear 
of not being forgiven needs steady rain. Shame, anxiety, worry, and regret take turns dominating the pages of this man's life. Shame for the mistakes that he has committed. Worry for the consequences he now faces. Anxiety over what could have happened and regret over what did happen. And many people are in that same situation when it comes to God because they feel that they have um, uh, let down themselves, let down everybody, but the heaviest weight on their shoulders is that they let God down. They feel that somehow, Pastor, I can't make it because maybe I have out God's grace. So what's the sense even trying? I've outspent God's mercy. I've overdrawn on God's favor. Some feel that they can only go but so far that, that they can't, if they keep writing mercy checks, sooner or later one of them's going to bunce. And that's exactly where the enemy of your soul wants you. He wants you to believe that you've gone too far. But how many of you know that we're sin abounds? Grace doth much more abound. And I thank God for that. And see, the devil will make you feel that you've been praying and you can't get the victory and that somehow the throne room is locked and you don't have the key and you've pounded on the doors but you can't get your prayers answered. I know how that feels. All of us know how that feels when we're trying to access God and it feels like we can't get into the very presence of God. Can I get a witness out there? And no access to God is serious business because you, be, you began to feel like an orphan, unprotected and, and exposed in the universe. Heaven seems to be removed from your itinerary. You become vulnerable in this life and doomed in the one to come. And we all have some fear that we uh, can relate to of disappointing God. And that disappointment has teeth. Not only does it have teeth, it has bite. But I want to suggest to you that Jesus has a set of forceps. And, 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 and he, he can do some serious defanging on your fears. In fact, when he gets through with you, he can perform a powerful roof canal. Now, now, I'm bringing this up because the man in this story is not just paralyzed uh, in his body, but, but, but he, is, he is paralyzed because we realize that his, his sins actually got him to this situation. It was his lifestyle that got him in this situation. So he feels that he is all alone and that God has forgotten him. How many people have ever felt that God has forgotten your address? That you're in this thing all by yourself and that nothing seems to work and the harder that you try, you don't seem to have any, any, any hope. But I like what Jesus says to the paralyzed man. He says, be of good cheer son your sins are forgiven come on and give the Lord a hearty amen for that amen. to get that word you see because the devil will make you mess you up with one act that didn't call, that didn't last a long time but then he'll beat you on the head can I get a witness for the rest of your life for that one wrong thing that you did but you need to hear from that this pulpit today that Jesus says your sins are forgiven you you see, most people have trouble forgiving themselves. And therefore, the devil works on that. But I thank God for Jesus because he is a God that can forgive you. Might I suggest that maybe the capacity to live a cheerful life, a happy life, and a joyful life begins with the, the reality that the sin crisis has been solved. I ought to hear an amen on that. You see, our problem in Bermuda is sin. But the news from this pulpit today is that Jesus has solved the sin problem. Come on and talk to me. I know that sin is still running down here, but I thank God that before the foundation of the world that he became the Lamb of God that was slain to take away the sins of the world. Come on and talk to me. And that's why when you study uh, your Bible, you discover that God has a plan to wrap this thing up and to cleanse the universe of sin. No more sinners, no more heartaches, no more trouble, no more pain, no more gang violence. Come on and talk to me. No more arguments, no more bills. Hallelujah. Oh, you all got your bills paid for? I'm still, you pray for me then. Whew. The sin crisis has an answer. And if you walked in here today like the rest of us, struggling to make heaven your home, you ought to thank God that he solved the sin problem.
that one day there will be no more sin in the universe. Come on and talk to me. Now that makes some, makes some people glad because you enjoy your sins. But for those of us who have been there and tired of that, we are glad to know that one day there will be no more sin, no more suffering, no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more funerals. Come on and talk to me. No more crying, no more dying. That's good news. What do you say? Now, now this man that Jesus spoke to was sick because his, of his lifestyle. He could not move, according to the scriptures, because he was a paralytic. He was a man lying on a mat, disabled. He could not walk the dog. He could not jog in the neighborhood. And he certainly could not join Kalita O'Brien in the 24th of May race. <laughs> he was paralyzed and lying on a mat which means that in his head, he could give instructions that his body could not follow. Mm. I hear Paul in that, because in Romans 7, he said, the good that I would, I do not. And the bad that I don't want to do, that I find myself doing. Have you ever been in a situation where your mind said, do it, but your body didn't follow? Oh, you Christians out there looking all righteous to me. Have you ever made a decision that you did not follow. How many times have you made a promise that you did not keep? Mm -hmm. How many times uh, have you said something in your mind that you didn't follow through with your body? See, 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 the deeper meaning of the metaphor in this thing called paralysis is that he wouldn't be on the mat if everything in his life was working. The reason he's on the mat it's because something in his life is not working. And we must ask ourselves, what systems, what structures, what friendships, what relationships, what activities, what mets have we built into our lives to compensate for what we know is not working because whatever they are, that's your met. And I must ask you, did, did you bring your mat with you today? You see, the mat that we lay on is designed to comfort us in what we know is wrong with us, but it does not confront us to fix us with what is wrong with us. Ah, see, 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 stay with me, stay with me. And so, uh, so we, 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 we want to be comforted, but we don't want to be confronted with the things that are not working in our lives. We, we, we don't want to be confronted with the challenge of being a better person, of being a better woman, of being a better husband, of being a better wife, a better father, a better mother, a better employer or employee, or a better church member. Hmm? We don't seek to be great witnesses for Christ because we're content to sit in the pew. We don't step outside of our comfort zones to make new friends, uh, make friends of new members. We're content to invite the same people home from year to year because we like that mat. How many mats do we have in our lives for the things that we don't confront? for the way that you mismanage your money, for the souls that you could have won, but you have, you're comfortable with your mat. Is there anybody in here today who is honest enough to admit that you've been making it on your mat? You could have already been successful, but you're content to be on your mat. You could already be strong, but you're content to be on your mat of mediocrity. You could be healed and delivered and victorious, but you're content with your mat ministry. That's why it's possible to come here every week just getting by. You've worked it out. You know how to do this thing. You show up when it's right and then leave and you're, you're good because you're dealing with mat ministry. You're, you're only at that level. This man was paralyzed. He had all the parts, but they were not connecting. And anytime you have anything, everything you need to function, but it does not function, that's dysfunction. See, everything you claim to relate to, you should function in. Because if you're not functional, it's because you're dysfunctional. That's why before I hear your opinion, I want to know your involvement. Because your opinion is only as valid as your involvement. Telling me how to do evangelism and you can't even come to the meeting. If you're not actively helping, you are inactively hurting. If you're not contributing to the solution, I got news for you, it's because you're a part of the problem. See, God will not bless you in an area that you're doing nothing in. Psalms 1 says, blessed is a man that doeth something. That's where God starts blessing you. 
And I'm wondering right now, as I speak to you, how much stronger you would be as a Christian if you were connected to the titles that you wear and the relationships that you claim and the office that you hold and the life that you say you want to live and the place that you say you want to be. And that's why some of you are not respected because you're not connected. And if you're not connected, you're not respected. That's why you're not, you ought not sign up for more than you're willing to do. Do not take a title if you're not willing to fulfill it. Do not become a husband if you don't plan to be faithful. Don't become a wife if you know you don't really want to be married. Don't make a baby if you don't plan to be a parent. Don't sign up to be a member of the church and then sit around here paralyzed, inactive, got the name, but shame. So if you're going to be a choir member, you got to come to rehearsal and sing. If you're going to be a leader of the church, you got to show up at the board. If you're going to be a deacon, you got to deek. And we should not be looking for you on Wednesday night to ask who's going to lock the place up. Furthermore, you ought to be here because your soul needs to be here. So don't take the title if you don't plan to do the work. That's dysfunctional. You're paralyzed and you cripple the whole move of God. And then you invite Guests here, and they want to know where is the church. Don't invite people home if you don't plan to be there. Do not be dysfunctional because you perpetuate what you don't plan to demonstrate. Why join the church if you don't plan to come? Why be a member if you don't plan to support the movement? Why? And that's why this man is on the mat. He's on the mat because he's dysfunctional. He's paralyzed. He's lying there in his excuses and there with his mat ministry. See, the mat was, the, 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 the mat was designed to comfort him, and that's why he didn't want to change or challenge him. Some scholars say he was living the life he loved and loving the life he lived. And whenever you're so comfortable in your Laodiceanness and you're just uh, uh, watching the church get by, it's because you don't want to change until he heard about a man named Jesus. You see, back in his day, the doctors and the Pharisees told him that if you're afflicted with paralysis, it's because God's curse was on you. But how many of you are so glad to know today that God is still a loving God when things happen to you? And so he got word that lepers were being healed, and somehow hope sprung up in his heart. He heard of others that were being blessed, and he called his companions, and they loaded their crippled companion on the mat and went to see the teacher, got an audience with Jesus, took their broken body to Christ, because Christ challenges those who have limitations. And I'm so glad that we may be limited, but we serve an unlimited God. So when they got there, there was standing room only. Place was packed out. Jesus was preaching. People were sitting in the windows. The doorways were crowded. And all kinds of people were there. I mean, people who were there just there just to, just to see. The Pharisees were there to see what he would do wrong that day. Come on now. Like, like some people come to church just to see what's going to happen that day. Others were sitting there. They weren't converted, but they were all there. But this man by now had said to his companions, listen, I want to see Jesus. And basically, let me say this, because I don't have much time. He resolved, and you can find this in Desire of Ages, a book called Desire of Ages, written by a little lady who only had a third grade education. And yet she is number one in the Library of Congress. It's called Desire of Ages. The ABC manager is in the balcony. He sells them right over there. Not, not today. But, 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 but when you read that book, it talks about the fact that he was not, he was to the point now where, where even if Jesus didn't heal him, what he wanted now was forgiveness of his sins. And he longed to be in his presence. That's 
that's why when I come to church, I'm glad to see y'all. I'm glad to shake hands with all kinds of people. But I really came to be in his presence. I, I came to be hobnob with my God. I got to taste and see that God is. I got to be filled up in his presence. So new members, when you come here and the church is packed out with all kinds of people that have the potential to be obstacles to Jesus Christ, you better long to be in his presence. So they got there and they faced an overwhelming obstacle. Obstacles have a way of challenging us. But obstacles don't have to define us. What I like about these four men, they couldn't get in through the door. And so they concocted a plan to get in through the roof. Have mercy. Can you imagine that? Mark chapter 2 says they were not able to get past the door. So they got in got up on the roof and opened up the roof and let this paraplegic, but am I saying that right? Paraplegic, yeah, on a stretcher. See how you can handle, see how you handle obstacles in your life will determine the end of your story. And see, 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 there are some people who never reached their goals because they saw obstacles in the way. But there are others here today who can tell you that they had to go through some obstacles. They had to cry some tears. They had to burn the midnight oil. But they overcame. Because your obstacles don't need to define you. Can I get a witness in this place? Uh, what I like about this story is that no matter who this man had in his life, he had, some, he had three or four tear the roof off people in his life. Come on and talk to me. You, everybody needs some tear the roof off people. You don't need to surround your people, your, yourself with people who say, well, it ain't been done before. Or you can't do it. Or you might as well give up. Come on and talk to me. I, I'm glad that all his friends were not uh, you know, in the same situation. You need to surround yourself with people who are going somewhere. You need to surround yourself with some friends who can lift you up to Jesus. That's what they did. Unconventional. Broke open the roof. Can I tell you something? It's important to connect with people who are trying to take you somewhere. I, I started a course four years ago, and <laughs> after the first week, I told one of my buddies, I'm out of here. I, I'm not computer literate. He said, sit down. <laughs> he said, I, you, if you knew where I just come from, coming from South America, I, I, I'm here by someone else's help. I'm not even got the money to pay for this apartment. And, and, and I'm going to make it by God's grace. I said, listen, man, I'm two hours away from LAX. I'm out of here because I can't, I can't, I'm not too savvy on a computer. He said, Mandus, sit down. Put me in, in his pastor study. I'm so glad he did that because four years later, come on and talk to me. I, I'm one of the top four. Woo. But I'll be honest with you, I gotta confess, I gotta be honest with you, uh, Jamal. I have, my last paper that I wrote was October 31st. I haven't picked it up since. <laughs> and so when I was studying this message, I was being rebuked. I got a call from a brother who's gonna march in August, who used to sit beside me. And I said to myself when I was in that class, if anybody's marching, I'm marching with them. But I must be honest with you, I dropped the ball. But when he called me and told me that, hey, Mandos, you can do it. Go pick up, pick up that thing and write that chapter. I've been encouraged. It's nice to have people who can get you back up on your feet. Come on and talk to me. <laughs> Surround yourself with people who, are, who and inspire you. That's why the church needs some spiritual guardians for new believers. Which means that when we ask them to come to Sabbath school, we're asking 10 and 20 and 30 year old Christians. I've been in the church all that time. Maybe you feel that you graduated from Sabbath school and you don't need to come to prayer meeting. But it can be very discouraging if we ask them to come to prayer meeting and you're not there. And so what happens is they see that you're not there and they say, oh, it's not necessary. 
But I'm praying for a church today that will be friends that will lift people higher. Come on and talk to me. Because we all need somebody that we can aspire to be like. May God help us as a church not to be paralyzed. I'm just looking at what not to say so I can hurry up. Now, I'll, I'll go to this part. We, we don't know the reaction of the homeowner, but you can, you can imagine. We don't know the reaction of the Met. I mean, he was let down on a bungee cord. Are you listening to me? That's, that's innovative, but I don't know how he felt about that. But, what, but, 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 but what, what we do know is that Jesus did not object. And, and Matthew all but paints a smile on the face of Jesus. See, because Jesus issued a blessing on the man before one was requested. Hold that, hold that, hold that. That's because God is blessing you every day without you asking him. So when you get up in the morning, you ought to thank God that before you even asked him for anything, he woke you up this morning. You ought to praise him for that. Because he blesses you whether you ask for it or not. Can I get a witness? In fact, my Bible says he blesses the just and the unjust so whether you're looking for him or not he's still looking over you can i get a witness that while we were yet sinners doing our thing he was still blessing you and still keeping you and still protecting you you ought to come to your senses and praise him just for that can i get a witness that long before you asked him he was watching over you Gave the man a blessing that he didn't request. But then he gave him a blessing that he was not expecting. He was expecting for Jesus to say to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that's not what Jesus said. And the Pharisees are there to listen to what he's about to say. To see if he will drop the ball. And he being Jesus. Knows this man's history. And knows that his problem. Is not just his physical man. But knows that his problem. Is the spiritual man. He says son. Thy sins be forgiven thee. You see because. The real problem of the man. And the real problem is sin. He could have said to the man. Ah, your legs are healed. Your paralysis is taken, taken away. Go ahead and sign up for the 24th of May race from St. George's next year. He could have said that. I just threw that in there to wake a few people up. <sighs> but he didn't say that. This man has limbs as sturdy as spaghetti in hot water. Yet Jesus offers mercy, not muscle. What is he trying to say? What is he trying to tell us? I submit to you that he was thinking about our deepest problem, and our deepest problem is sin. His lifestyle got him in that situation in the first place. But aren't you glad that even though he dropped the ball and he failed and his lifestyle got him in that situation, aren't you glad for what Jesus said? The first words out of Jesus was, Son, You ought to stop right there because everybody else has been courting him lame duck and paralyzed and he got all kinds, but he knows him as son. He said, You messed up, but you're still my son. You disobeyed my word, but you're still my son. You ain't been church lately, but you're still my son. Is anybody thankful today that God will still call you his son? He knows that if he can heal him of his sins, he can take care of the rest of it. And so he first treats his soul because the man's sickness was a direct result of his life of sin. He could have healed his body, but that just would have made him a stronger sinner. And I'm convicted that sometimes the Lord allows sickness and allows us to check out of here because if we had more strength, we'd go back into the old lifestyle. So when God's got you on your deathbed sometimes, he knows that that's the best place to save you. I'm sorry, but it happens like that sometimes. Because see, if he doesn't heal you now, he can raise you on resurrection morning. But if he heals some other people right now, they can't, you can't find them in church. 
When they get their limbs right, they can't walk to church. Come on, talk to me. So sometimes he got to cripple us and allow us to be paralyzed because that's the only place he can, he can help us to realize our salvation. He, I like what Jesus did. He started, he, he didn't start with his condition. He starts with son. You see, I like that. He starts with his position, not his condition. He says, you are my son, regardless of your condition. I love Jesus, don't you? Yeah. I'm going to skip a lot of this because I, I want to come back and I want you to come back to the service this afternoon. See, sin was the problem and it's only until we realize that Jesus has, this, has the problem to overcome sin that we will truly be free. When your sins, I'm closing, when your sins are forgiven, you are truly free. When God lifts the burden of sin off your back, when God liberates your soul, when he who has, I'm closing. When, I mean, I could go on, but I'm trying to let you out of here. When he could heal you, but rather he forgives you, he, it's because he loves you and he can't live without you. He really wants a relationship with you. And that's why I'm so glad, glad this morning that we serve a God like that. Someone who, ex, who gives us his perfect love. Someone who knows that we're imperfect, but he looks beyond our past. He looks beyond our faults and sees all of our needs. Is anybody glad for a God like that? That your past is messed up and jacked up, but today he calls you son. Your sins are forgiven you. There's nothing more liberating than being and having your head free. So this preacher's got to close this sermon early today and say, would you be free from your burden of sin? There is power. Can I get a witness? Power. Wonder working power in the pressure blood of the lamb <laughs> I got three little girls on the second row I said if the pastor gets too long just do this and they said pastor thank you so I'm closing Woo! somebody today you got some issues something that's bothering you you get no rest you can't sleep at night it bothers you you haven't confronted it you, you, can, you can work longer hours. You can be busy around the church. Keep your attention on me, please. You can be busy around the church. And, and we can cover up our, our sin problem with, by, by being busy. But that doesn't get rid of the sin problem. So today, sometimes God has to take away a job so he can get your attention to deal with you because he loves you so much. He doesn't want you to just keep on working and making money and, and going and going. You can get all that down here, but he wants you because he can provide for your needs. But your greatest need is to surrender your sins to him. Father in heaven, many of us find ourselves on our mat. We know we've studied this thing. We know how to do this thing. We have a met ministry. Some people are watching by church pond and discouraged. Wouldn't come to, to church. They're on their mattress watching the service. But no, there's nothing like being in your presence. And we're so hungry to be connected to you. And I'm asking for your people today that you would connect us. Somebody may feel disconnected. But today they can experience the grace of God. And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder if there's a praying church praying for somebody. If you feel good in your relationship, that's fine. I'm going to ask you to pray for somebody else. Because there, it's possible that someone walked in here today. And right about now, they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And they don't want form and fashion. They need a relationship. They need a connection with Jesus Christ. And if you feel like that today, I'm going to raise your hand. Because I want to pray specifically for you. You have felt disconnected 
Maybe because of your life. Maybe some decision. Maybe you feel haunted and that thing keeps coming back and you feel guilty. God wants to remove the guilt and take the shame away so that you can be free 